Okay, I think we're recording. Hi, everyone. It's Marcy. It's uh, June 4th. It's Thursday. It's somehow almost 8 o'clock at night already, and I'm not really quite sure how. I'm talking to you now from my um, recording studio at home. Uh, I recorded my audiobook in this little cave in what is also my art painting studio. Um, my friend Frank helped me set this thing up with a room divider and a lot of blankets and today my big six foot uh, book poster arrived of course my mic's in front of it but you guys can see it's pretty cool it'll come with me at all my book signing events and things that'll happen once we're not in quarantine anyway um so it's uh welcome to the permission to land vip launch team this is my uh second video uh, today is Thursday, June 4th. It will be our thankful Thursdays. It's pretty easy, at least for me, it's pretty easy. I think it should be for all of us to come up with certain things that we're thankful for and be grateful. Living in gratitude makes for such a more meaningful life. And if we can name the things that are important to us, the things that we are grateful for, then um, we are aware of them and we acknowledge them and we can live in grace with them. Um, I'm grateful, thankful for my family's health. I'm thankful that we have gotten through what I think is hopefully, at least for now, the worst of this coronavirus, COVID-19, quarantine, social distancing, um, stay at home thing. Um, New York State is slowly coming out of um, court, uh, um, law and uh, losing my train of thought. Uh, New York State is certainly com slowly coming out of this and starting phase one this week and um, in the city too and upstate is like phase two and phase three and we're slowly starting to get back to our normal lives. Um, hopefully what we bring with us is a new sense of priorities and a new sense of what really is vitally important, the health and safety and welfare of our families. Um, which kind of brings me to the next thing. Um, the whole world seems to be exploding over uh, Black Lives Matter and George Floyd's unfortunate murder. And um, I've made a few posts on my regular Facebook page, uh, on my Instagram feed about my thoughts, but I, I really struggled for quite a um, a while with precisely what to say and how to say it. And um, I spent some time talking to a former student of mine and to my friends and um, doing a lot of reading, educating myself, doing a lot of research. I like to research things. It makes me feel like I'm in more control. Um, and I wrote 34 minutes ago, actually, I wrote an article for Elephant Journal. It just went live on their site called We Can't Hide Behind White Privilege Anymore. We Must Be Anti-Racists Because Black Lives Matter. And I would like to take this thankful Thursday on what is um, a lovely hot day in June and read my article. I mean, you can all find it on Elephant Journal and I have linked it in the VIP site, the VIP launch team site and on my regular Facebook page. And um, I will do so on Instagram at Marcy Brockman 27 um, in a bit. So here's the article. Pardon my rant here, but I am angry and disillusioned and disappointed in this country. What I have seen in the last three years or more has really changed my opinion. Let me be clear. There is so much joy, love, beauty, kindness, caring, empathy, and compassion in this country and our world, but there is also hatred, stupidity, judgment, closed-mindedness, anger, frustration, resentment, violence, distrust, impudence, and fear that lately anyway seems to be increasingly fueled by a federal government hell-bent on dividing us and, dis and instigating hatred. I am a white Jewish woman, a progressive Democrat, a free-thinking contributor to ACLU and to the Southern Poverty Law Center, who believes that the content of one's character is the most important thing about a person. We are all the same. We all bleed the same. We all cry the same. We all love the same. We all want to live in a safe, peaceful life filled with love and community and the opportunity to provide for ourselves and our children. All of us, globally, 
all of humanity wants the same things. I believe that, although there are a great many who disagree, the majority of people who walk this earth are in agreement. We are all the same. Where did this go wrong? This is how I explain what I hardly understand to my students. It's oversimplified, but to me it makes sense. Centuries ago, with the European imperialist mindset of stealing whatever they wanted from anyone, anywhere, just because they had the mighty army's greed and impudence to do so without hesitation or conscience to think for a second that it might be wrong. The new world was colonized, but it was actually stolen from the Native Americans who had made their home here for thousands of years. In the building of European settlements and the colonies that became the states of the United States, the slave trade started and expanded, leading to the U.S. Civil War and the civil wars in other countries, such as apartheid in South Africa, and we all know how that turned out. But after enduring centuries of systemic institutionalized racism, it has taken approximately 157 years since the Emancipation Proclamation to progress this far, hardly far at all. Throughout the 20th century, too many Black Americans and other people of color lived through the Jim Crow laws, the separate but unequal systemic racial inequality of economics and education that included unequal access to medical care even when the Black Americans' contribution to medical discoveries saved millions of lives of all colors, races, religions, and nationalities worldwide. Thank you, Henrietta Lacks. The systemic institutionalized racism is inescapable and affects every single decision, every single day for every single Black person in this country and the world, and not just in the last two centuries, but even today. I was in tears yesterday after watching an Instagram video made by a former student of mine. Isaiah Washington is a highly intelligent, talented, compassionate young Black man who expressed his constant, overwhelming grief with palpably emotional expression. With his tears, he moved me through my own, and I started to think as a mom about all the millions of mothers of Black boys and men who live in constant fear for the health, safety, and welfare of their amazing sons, for whom a simple walk to the corner store or school, or a simple drive to visit grandma, or a simple commute to work could be deadly. Too many Blacks mostly men, I think, but women too, are stopped, questioned, harassed, pulled over, arrested, roughed up, sized up, ridiculed, suspected, scrutinized, accused, and killed for no other reason than the color of their skin. As Neil deGrasse Tyson put it in his article, Reflections on the Color of My Skin, every day they face hyper-focused, unfair, biased scrutiny, and false, dangerous accusations made by police against people of color whose only crimes were DWB, driving while black, WWB, walking while black, and of course, JBB, just being black. My best friend's black husband has gotten pulled over, harassed, and questioned by the police in his own Long Island, New York neighborhood four times in the last couple of weeks. Every Black person I've talked to has these same experiences every single day. This BS has, allowed, has been allowed to continue as we carry on with our own lives and the millions of distractions that parade through our lives. I have this luxury. I am a white Jewish woman who has faced a bit of anti-Semitism. As a child, I was spat on. And last winter, I was insulted and told that I'm not really white because I'm a Jew, that I'm a fake white person and the vitriol with which this was stated scared me and temporarily caused me to shrink away and cower. But I had the luxury of hiding behind my pale skin and not dealing with it head on. I closed my eyes to it and moved on. I had my white privilege to hide behind. Too many of us hide there in plain sight and don't know that in doing so, we are part of the problem. Our silence perpetuates this awfulness. I have tried explaining white privilege to people, and it is beyond frustrating that they don't see it. I see and feel and experience my white privilege every damn day, and I try to speak out and speak up and spread awareness and educate the ignorant while black people get murdered for being black every damn day. I can go jogging, ask for help after a car crash, listen to loud music in public, ask for directions, talk on my cell phone, sit on my own front porch go to a party, shop, 
read a book in my own car, carry boxes of my own stuff, run, take out my wallet, breathe, and live, all without being harassed, bullied, beaten, questioned, or killed just because of the color of my skin. For every single one of these banal actions, black people have been murdered. This is some serious level BS. Sure, it's technically illegal to discriminate against somebody because of their gender, skin color, sexual identity, or preference, but it happens every day anyway, and quite often by the police who have sworn to protect and defend. For too long, people have turned a blind eye or expressed their thoughts and prayers and then moved on. For too long, this has continued. This past week or so, it seems the tide may be turning. After months of living in fear of the deadly coronavirus and COVID-19, where millions of people worldwide were quarantined indoors to flatten the curve and slow the spread of this virus, I think we were more than ready to pounce like an overwound spring. Then when the tragic murder of George Floyd broke the news, the tightly coiled spring erupted, and all across the nation, citizens with anti-racist passions took to the streets, cities, the small towns, and Washington, D.C. to make their collective voices heard. The First Amendment of our Constitution protects our right to protest. It is ingrained in our citizenship that it is our responsibility to challenge overreaching authority. Quote, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of the press or the right of the people to a peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The most American thing we can do, then, is protest for the redress of grievances. And yet, armed like they were going to war, many police forces in our nation who were sworn to protect the citizens instead opened fire on peaceful protesters with tear gas, rubber bullets, and drove armored police cars through crowds mowing down innocent peaceful protesters. Yes, there were some who were fed up with the lack of improvement on this huge issue and the magnitude of the lives lost, who looted and set fire to buildings to express their vehemence, frustration, and anger at the banal platitudes being offered. After being told that every method of peaceful protest is wrong and inappropriate, the frustration took over. The police should have focused their attention on the looters and protected the peaceful protesters in their efforts to keep the peace and avoid draconian curfews. If you are the police, pause and reflect how great is the country whose constitution endorses peaceful protests. Neil deGrasse Tyson, Reflections on the Color of My Skin. So how do we change this? In that same article, Neil deGrasse Tyson has some suggestions for police departments. These are his suggestions. Here he offers a list for policy experts to consider. One, extend police academies to include months of cultural awareness and sensitivity training that also includes how not to use lethal force. Two, all police officers should be tested for any implicit bias they carry with established thre thre thresholds of acceptance and rejection from the police academy. We all carry bias. Most of us do not hold the breathing lives of others in our hands when influenced by it. Three, during protests, protect property. Protect lives. If you attack nonviolent protesters, you are being un-American. And if we, and if we wouldn't need draconian curfews, and we wouldn't need draconian curfews if police arrested looters instead of protesters. <coughs> Four, if fellow officers are behaving in a way that is clearly unethical or excessively violent, and you witness this, please stop them. Someone will get that on video, offering the rest of us confidence that you can police yourselves. In these cases, our trust in you matters more to a civil society than how much you stick up for one another. Five, and here's a radical idea for the Memphis Police Department, uh, Minneapolis Police Department. Why not give George Floyd the kind of full dress funeral you give others, you give each other for dying in the line of duty, a vow that such a death will never happen again? And then six, lastly, when you see black kids in the street, think of what they can be rather than what you think they are. Reflections on the Color of My Skin by Neil deGrasse Tyson. I am angry, frustrated, scared, and heartbroken. I don't have the answers. But there are actionable things we can do. We can support Black-owned businesses. We can donate money to the victims' families. We can educate ourselves. 
I don't pretend to know what it feels like, but I will forever stand with my black sisters, brothers, friends, students, and neighbors. The evil that is racism must stop. I commit to being part of the change that is long overdue in this world, and I hope you will too. I do this today and every day because Black Lives Matter. And in the text of the article, uh, there are lots of hyperlinks that bring you to websites for education, for action, for political mindedness, for education and instruction. Anyway, it's there. You can go to elephantjournal.com, search for my name, and it's there. There's also um, links on our permission, permission to Land VIP launch team and on my general Facebook page. Um, you can find me by searching for Marcy Brockman or it's uh, at Marcy27. Um, and it will be on my Instagram. Anyway, thankful. Thankful Thursday. I'm thankful for all of you for being here. I'm thankful for all of you who are my friends and family and loved ones and extended community and students and people close to my heart for being here with me on this wild ride of publishing my book. I'm thankful that I was able to say what I need to say. I'm thankful that I can be of benefit to others, that the experiences that I've survived and the skills, the life skills that I've learned along the way can help other people, can be a benefit to them as they are forging their own happiness and their own meaning in their own lives. I'm thankful for my children and their health and my amazing husband and, and his endless patience with me. I'm thankful for my friends without whose love and guidance and community and caring I could not live without. And um, I think that kind of says it all. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Have a good night.